Hello, everyone, and welcome to our keynote lunch with Grace Young. We are super thrilled to be able to host this discussion on gentrification in Chinatowns across the US, the effects of the pandemic, and the efforts to preserve AAPI small businesses and Chinese culinary traditions. Um, and especially thrilled um, to do it with an award-winning cookbook author, culinary historian, and Chinatown advocate. Um, when I posed the question to our advisory board about who would be an interesting, timely, and inspiring speaker, um, Grace's name really rose to the top and received a lot of energy and excitement. Um, I want to give a special thank you to our advisory board member, Joyce Pisnanat, at National Capacity, who really helped to make this conversation happen. I wanna just remind you that this lunch is sponsored by Uber Eats. Um, and I don't know about the rest of you y'all, but um, I used my Uber Eats gift certificate to support a local BIPOC um, and immigrant owned small business, Momolicious, which is a Nepali um, place just around the corner from me um, that serves Nepali soup dumplings. So I hope you are joining me um, for this conversation um, to get some local, small, to support us local small business and join us in this lunch conversation. Um, Grace is going to be more fully introduced by Tommy, Tommy Wong, who is joining us as the principal of Civic Design Studio in Oakland, California. His work on public art and education, cultural hubs and business district management spans over 20 years. Um, and has received numerous federal, state, and local level awards. Um, he helped to create Good Good Eats um, as a response to the pandemic and was responsible for bringing over $2 million and over um, 20 uh, Chinatown businesses, has supported 50, more than 50 businesses in Oakland um, in business strategies and marketing and providing over 100,000 meals for needy family. So I'm really excited to see Tommy and Grace in conversation um, about their respective work. Welcome, Tommy. Hello, everyone. My name is Tommy. Thank you, Willow, for that uh, introduction. Um, Civic Design Studio um, is part of a creative partnership group that we just formed, uh, you know, Good Good Eats was created during the pandemic as a response to all the hard stuff that was happening at the time. And so now we're uh, trying to work on the next phase, which is seeding creative accelerators uh, in cultural districts, Chinatown, uh, the Latino district in our area, Fruitvale, the Black Cultural Zone in our city. Um, we're trying to really bring together creative minds to take places like Chinatown and pivot them into the 21st century. Um, we work with Cut Fruit Collective, so please look them up on uh, Instagram, Oakland Bloom, and Cultivate Labs in San Francisco, Cultivate with a K. Um, we're going to be traveling together along the West Coast in February to talk about Chinatowns and other Asian hubs. Um, and see what can happen from there. So I'm just very happy to be here. Um, very interested in, in talking to Grace about how do you keep, expand, and connect immigrant and BIPOC hubs in the U.S. And um, yeah, that's about it right now. So before we, we dive in and start talking to Grace, uh, there's a PBS special um, that we should watch right now. Holly? The pandemic threatened business districts across the country, but misguided fears and rhetoric about Asian Americans made things particularly hard for Chinatown neighborhoods. For this report, during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, John Yang visited one of the nation's most well-known Chinatowns in New York City. It's part of our ongoing Race Matters series. Dim sum carts stacked with bamboo steamer baskets, bustling kitchens, board games in the park. These days, Manhattan's Chinatown looks a lot like its pre-pandemic self. It was very, very eerie during... And walk through the heart of the neighborhood with cookbook author Grace Young and the scars of the pandemic are evident. This was a family-owned supermarket and it closed during COVID. 
They had been there for years and years and they just didn't have the business. As we come along, here is Lung Moon Bakery. This was the place to go for custard tarts and their moon cakes were just out of this world. What else is lost when a business like that disappears? So it's not just about the wonderful food, it's about our memories. And so many people talk about the fact that they've been going to Lung Moon ever since they were a child. And I believe when you lose a place like Lung Moon, you lose a part of yourself. Young, known as the stir fry guru, grew up going to San Francisco's Chinatown with her father, a Chinese American liquor salesman. I grew up just loving that small town feeling about Chinatown, that feeling of belongingness and home. But in the four decades she's lived in New York, Young says she had come to take this historic lower Manhattan neighborhood for granted. Because of my work, I would be in Chinatown once or twice a week, shopping for groceries, eating food, but I never introduced myself. I came and went and did my own thing. That all changed in early 2020 with the pandemic. Because of misinformation and xenophobia, people stopped coming to Chinatown. Young started sharing the struggles of mom and pop businesses on Instagram and Facebook and helped create two social media campaigns, hashtag save Chinese restaurants and hashtag love AAPI. She launched a video project with a Korean American videographer, Dan Ahn, for the New York Museum Poster House, telling the stories of Chinatown shop and restaurant owners. Business has dipped down even worse, and I can say that I'm down pretty much from 50 to 70 percent. It is time to take more dramatic measures. Hours after Young conducted those interviews, then New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a citywide lockdown bringing business to a virtual standstill. By 2021, a survey found that more than half of Asian-owned businesses in New York State reported that their revenue had dropped more than 75 percent. COVID deaths this time it take really long for, for, for really serious, serious damage for, for our business. Dennis Chung was born in what was then called Saigon, and since 1995, he's owned Pasteur Grill and Noodles, a Vietnamese restaurant that's one of the many legacy Chinatown businesses that isn't Chinese. The downturn in business during the pandemic has put them behind on their rent. And today, he's facing another challenge. It look like the business back to the normal, but you don't forget one thing. Everything in fashion right now, the, the price, everything is go up right now. This was his American dream, and COVID turned it into a nightmare. Chung's son, Tony, is getting his master's degree in biomedical science this summer and is applying to med school. Watching his dad struggle during the pandemic, he wanted to help, offering ideas about the decor and the menu and applying for federal aid. A lot of these businesses are owned by people who, who don't speak a word of English, except maybe they know how to say some food items on their menu. So you know, it's close to impossible for them to apply for, for PVP and all these all these um, government grants. And on top of everything else, the Chungs, along with other residents and business owners, have had to deal with increased anti-Asian harassment. Sometimes I see people coming into our restaurant yelling slurs and just giving us trouble. And, you know, I see my dad trying to be strong, but I, I, I worry about him deep down. The history of American Chinatowns is rooted in racism as Chinese immigrants arrived in the mid-1800s to mine gold and build railroads. Cookbook author Grace Young. The Americans wanted cheap labor, but even as they wanted cheap labor, they did not want the Chinese to live among Americans. So the Chinese were segregated to live in their own ghettos, and that's how Chinatowns formed. Just as some made Asian Americans scapegoats in the early days of COVID, in the 19th century, they were unfairly blamed for smallpox outbreaks in some cities. Stanford University historian Gordon Chang. The Chinese became targeted uh, as a population that was not just undesirable in taste or in preference, but as biologically dangerous and thus uh, should be eliminated and moved out of the core of the city uh, lock, stock, and barrel moved into some corner or kept out of country entirely. In recent decades, historic Chinatowns have faced new challenges like gentrification and an aging population. 
Vic Lee sees it in New York's Chinatown, where she lives. The authenticity that is here comes from the residents, many of which are low income. And for them to be this integral part of the community, but also be unable to stay, this is what's really at risk for the authenticity of Chinatown and what it's going to look like. For Lee's late grandmother, Tai Mui Chang, who couldn't read or speak English, Chinatown was her piece of America. I have such fond memories of you know, scooping rice into the rice bowls, carrying it back to the dinner table. And once she sat, we would all like bend our elbows and eat. And I actually, I have a tattoo where it's uh, 135, which stands for her apartment building. During the pandemic, Lee co-founded the nonprofit Welcome to Chinatown, which has given almost $600,000 to small businesses. We are focused on uplifting our community's entrepreneurs because we know that they're what grounds this community. Are you optimistic about the future of Chinatown? I'm cautiously optimistic. There's still a lot more that needs to be done in this community. But where I am optimistic is seeing how much people care. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Cookbook author Grace Young, recently recognized by both the James Beard and Julia Child Foundations for her work supporting Chinatowns, is still worried by what she sees on the streets of Chinatown. How do you feel when you see empty storefronts? It completely terrifies me. And I feel that we have to do everything in our power to save and protect Chinatown. Everyone has to do our part, and uh, history will thank us for that. For Young, her part is raising awareness across the country on social media, but it's also doing what she can for businesses in her own Chinatown. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm John Yang in New York. Thank you very much. And without further ado, uh, let's bring in the star of the show. Yay, Grace Young, Grace Young. Hello, how are you, Grace? Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. I don't feel like the star of the show. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start things off with, uh, with an easy question and then follow it up with a little something that to uh, explain, you know, your journey. So first easy question is, what was your favorite meal this week and why? Uh, my favorite meal this week was uh, definitely in Chinatown. I, uh, there's one restaurant that I love in particular. It's sort of like Sophie's Choice. I, I actually can't, I shouldn't reveal one of my favorite restaurants because there are so many uh, out there that I love. But one is Hop Lee, and it's a favorite of locals, and it's been around for almost 50 years. And it reminds me a lot of the kind of restaurant that my father used to bring me to. And when you go there, specifically at lunchtime, you often see the local postal workers have a table, the local uh, school teachers have their table. Um, there's a woman. Fong Tai, who uh, is 93 and eats her lunch there every single day. The restaurant is closed on Sundays. But um, it, so it's a feeling of warmth to just be there. I call it the cheers of Chinese restaurants, you know. And, and I don't know everyone, but the waiters uh, know me now. Many of them do. And um, it's, it's a really sweet feeling to just watch how everyone sort of, not everyone, but many people relate to each other. It's a meeting place. And uh, when I was growing up, whenever we would go and have dim sum, I felt it was like Chinese church. You know, my parents didn't go to church. But as we walked through the dining room, my father would stop it. It felt like every two or three tables and he would, say something to someone. And so that feeling of community and familiarity and belongingness, and the food is wonderful. You know, it's very old style Cantonese food. So um, that's a long answer for your question. <laughs> that's a great answer for your question, for the question. Um, let's move fast forward. I wanna hear your pandemic story. 
if you can explain to everyone, you know, what were you doing right before and how did things change once, once the pandemic hit? So I am a, I'm known as a Chinese cookbook author and I've written three cookbooks. I've done some videos. I'm also known as the walk therapist and the stir fry guru. Uh, that's what the New York Times calls me. Uh, at the start of 2020, I thought that I would start writing a proposal for a new cookbook. And I'm based in New York City. I'm normally in Chinatown once or twice a week. And uh, I immediately noticed in January, uh, before there were any incidents of COVID in America, really, um, that Chinatown had emptied out. It was very strange to walk down the streets where I'm normally uh, jostling with people or uh, shopping for produce and sort of elbowing the aunties and the pawpaws to like get my my vegetables. There was nobody. And glancing into restaurants and noticing that they were completely empty. And many businesses in Manhattan's Chinatown and throughout the United States and other Chinatowns uh, reported that their business dropped 40, 60, 80 percent. So I started doing posts on Instagram about like New Yorkers, you know, we need to like show our support to Chinatown and support these businesses. It was bitter cold January, New York City, freezing temperatures. And it was heartbreaking to look at the street produce vendors standing there out alone with no customers. Uh, Food and Wine magazine asked me to write a piece and I did about supporting Chinatown and it got this tremendous reaction from uh, people, it was posted on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, lots of people wrote that they had no idea that Chinatown was hurting. But it's because of the misinformation, the calling uh, coronavirus, China, China virus, Wuhan virus, the xenophobia that it brought on um, is the cause for the fact that Chinatowns became a ghost town. And um, and then something completely uh, unexpected occurred. And that is, as you saw in the video, there's a museum called Poster House Museum. I'd never walked into the museum. It was a brand new museum, but they had just opened an exhibition of Chinese posters. And they had asked me if I would do some lectures about food and culture. And so we were about to talk about what I would do. And then the director who I had never met calls me on March, Friday the 13th, and says, all New York City museums have closed. We're at home. I know Chinatown is hurting. What can Poster House Museum do to help Chinatown? Do you have any ideas? And it was so unbelievable that this total stranger would contact me and I said that I had an idea that I wanted to go into Chinatown and interview the owners of restaurants and shops and post these interviews on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And I thought that if New Yorkers heard their stories, that it would um, generate support, rally support for people to come into Chinatown. She said, if you do these interviews, we will put them on the Poster House website. So I got um, Dan on was mentioned in the PBS piece. Uh, I, I did a post on Instagram asking for a volunteer videographer. I did not know Dan. He meets me on Sunday, March the 15th. We go into Chinatown and we interview these owners. Only like a half dozen of them, less than a half dozen. And we were not prepared. These owners talked about the fact that business was so bad that 70% of restaurant owners had decided to close the following day and they had tears in their eyes. Um, we, we, it was so emotional, it was so heartbreaking. And the videos that we produced became coronavirus Chinatown stories. They've been shown at the Smithsonian. Later that night, de Blasio announces that New York City is going into lockdown. So if I had not gotten the call from Julia Knight of Poster House Museum, I would not have been there on that Sunday. And this idea that I had of wanting to do these videos would never have uh, become a reality. It was so critical that we were there that moment. 
And in fact, we were documenting one of the darkest days of New York City's Chinatown. Um, and that really shifted things for me. I think that um, it made me realize how bad the situation was. And when we went into lockdown, then my husband and I ended up taking walks into Chinatown every day. And it was so painful. It was apocalyptic. Chinatown was, I always call it like an empty Hollywood movie set of Chinatown. No cars, no people. It was just terrifying. And uh, I think that really shook me to my core. And I thought that I loved Chinatown before the pandemic hit. But I think um, this made me realize that I had taken Chinatown for granted. And um, when Chinatown reopened, um, there was a little vitality, but it was nothing like what it was pre-pandemic. And because of my position as a cookbook author, I reached out to some media people that I knew and got interviews on the local NPR show. Um, but media also reached out to me. So I did a piece for All Things Considered the day Chinatown reopened in 2020. It was like the beginning of June. Uh, the BBC radio interviewed me, today.com. Um, Food magazines normally reach out to me to write articles. Every time they reached out to say, would I write a stir fry piece? I would say, sure, but can I also write about Chinatown? So I was sort of wheeling and dealing to try and get attention for Chinatown. Um, bon Appetit asked me to do a video about a restaurant in Chinatown. And I said, can't, can't we do something to help Chinatown? And so they had me do an Instagram takeover for Bon Appetit. Then I did an Instagram takeover about Chinatown for Vogue magazine and the James Beard Foundation. And all of this culminated towards the end of 2020 with me approaching the James Beard Foundation saying, I would like to start a social media campaign to save Chinese restaurants, hashtag save Chinese restaurants. And to my shock, they partnered with me. And I think we, Again, it was just raising public awareness throughout the country that Chinese restaurants were hurting. And by 2021, I realized that, you know, it, it went far beyond Chinese restaurants and Chinatowns. And so I started a campaign a year later in 2021 called Love AAPI, trying to uh, bring awareness that Thai, Vietnamese, Malaysian, Japanese restaurants all needed our love and support and that they were all feeling the economic impact of COVID. But I think for so many Americans, this is so horrible to say, people don't even know what AAPI means and represents. Mm -hmm. And so I thought the concept of love AAPI was fantastic, but it, it sort of went fell into the dark hole. And we did get, you know, some great posts and it, and every little bit counts. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. Um, but I've given you a very long answer, but I just approached it from any way I could. And um, I used every contact that I knew and I just, nothing was too small. I, I would offer to, every day I went to Chinatown, I would offer to my neighbors and friends, do you need some takeout? Do you need some produce, vegetables, anything? I'll pick it up for you. Because all these businesses needed every little sale they could get. Yeah, absolutely. It was the same here in Oakland, too. Um, when you felt the implosion, our yeah. response immediately was to go outwards and establish the network. So, you know, we work with the schools, the libraries, the, you know, the businesses and figured out who could do what, set up the food distribution center. Okay, we can do that. World Central Kitchen is coming to Oakland. Let's hook up all of our businesses to it. Um, and then what, you know, it was our little, you know, it's, a, it's that window of opportunity you have because everyone else was reaching out too. So for us, it was a a horrible time, but it also showed the the resilience and the tenacity of folks. 
and at the same time, like a willingness to reach out that normally we, you know, normally people don't do. So Grace, you, you know, you've done such a brilliant job navigating social media or other people's social media on this. Um, just want to hear some of your thoughts about storytelling. Like, what is the power of the story in this situation for you? Um, that's a great question. Uh, and, and I don't feel brilliant at social media. When I had to do these Instagram takeovers, I, I spent the whole day in my pajamas doing it because it was just so overwhelming for me. But um, I think that people need to hear what makes Chinatown special. And when you walk into Chinatown, you don't really realize that some of these businesses are multi-generational. You don't realize that the produce vendor on, uh, on Mulberry and Canal Street gets up and starts her day, I think at like seven in the morning, takes her two or three hours and her workers just to set up all those carts. She has this amazing selection on Mulberry Street. And they're standing out there 12 hours on concrete. And on the hottest, most humid days in New York City where you don't want to be anywhere but inside your air conditioned like office or home, she's out there on the most brutal cold days in the winter when it's raining. Um, it's, I think these stories are very important to hear about what it takes to run these mom and pop businesses. There's a little floor shop in Manhattan's Chinatown and they had no business in 2020 because nobody was buying flowers. And so the husband started driving to Pennsylvania, getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning. It's an eight hour round trip drive for him, going to different farms in Pennsylvania and buying produce, bringing it back. He set up card tables in front of the shop and he was selling tomatoes, carrots, incredible produce um, and much cheaper when the main uh, farmer's market in New York City is Union Square. Mm -hmm. His prices were, I would say, like 30 to 40 percent cheaper. Sometimes I would say to my husband, like, he's selling the tomatoes for three, for a dollar. And um, how could he possibly be making money? Like, mm. this is not computing. But the fact that, you know, like when I heard what he was going through, when I saw the quality of the produce, I started writing about him on Instagram and uh, he started getting business. You know, like he would see me and he would say, Grace, you know, these people came by and said that they read about the store on your Instagram or Facebook page. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think it's just what's so special about Manhattan's Chinatown and I think Chinatowns across the United States is that they are family owned mom and pop businesses. 98% of the businesses in Manhattan's Chinatown are mom and pop. And during the pandemic, uh, we all heard about the fact that online sales went through the roof, that Amazon was doing, making more money than ever. And I understood the need for convenience and safety during the pandemic. But right now, I think it's really important to remind people that scrolling, clicking, ordering, and getting a box the next day does not compare with the experience of going to a mom and pop shop and having a relationship with somebody and knowing that the clerk knows that, you know, I love Lotus root. And so she's set it aside when I walk in, you know, oh, Grace, the Lotus root is in. It's really, really beautiful today. Or when you go into a Hopley restaurant and before you even open your mouth, the waiter knows, has a good guess of what you're going to order because he knows your pattern. Um, it's an enriching, it enriches our lives to have relationships as opposed to scrolling, clicking, using your delivery app and, you know, the next moment it arrives, right? That this is what, um, 
you know, America used to be built on small businesses. That was our, the backbone of America was small businesses. And we need to support these little mom and pop businesses that are all one of a kind. Yeah, definitely. And I think the hardest thing for me to have to figure out from the business district management side is unfortunately some businesses weren't, aren't built for a transition into the 21st century, right? Yeah. Um, we, we worked with over a two year span, probably over 60 to 70 businesses across Oakland. And I would say, I, I had to tell people, do not take a second mortgage out on your home to do this because you're not built for it. And so that's the unfortunate part of it. I mean, this is within a larger context, you're talking about uh, the di diaspora of older Asian populations to other parts. And what does that mean for older Chinatowns? What does that mean for newer Chinatowns? And do, they ever, do the two ever connect to each other? Which brings right. me to my next question, Grace, is I uh, wanted to ask a lot about New York, China, uh, Chinatowns. So Flushing, Brooklyn, the diaspora, and you know what's happening now. We know that you know Manhattan Chinatown has a lot of Fujianese. Um, could you kind of describe what New York's Chinatowns scene is like? Um, so I have to be very honest. I've concentrated my energies on Manhattan's Chinatown, and also for my own safety, I'm just not into like hopping on the subway and going out to Flushing and Sunset Park at this time. Um, the anti-Asian hate crimes are really uh, very intense in New York City right now. And so, um, yeah, so I've concentrated my energies here, but I would say, you know, we're just, we just had a fantastic summer um, where the weather was warm and that brought out everybody. And during the daytime, uh, Chinatown really felt like it was almost pre-pandemic. And there were a lot more tourists. Uh, in 2019, New York City had 66 and a half million tourists. I would venture to guess that in 2020, we had no tourists. And historic Chinatowns in San Francisco, New York, and Boston are dependent on tourism uh, for their survival. So 2021, there were some, and now 2022, a lot more but still not at pre-pandemic levels. Um, but I think so many of the businesses here right now, and in Manhattan's Chinatown, we lost over 150 stores and restaurants. That figure came in 2021. I don't know what the number is right now. Um, but so many of the businesses, as you saw in, in the PBS clip, uh, are still the past year grill and noodles was talking about how they're still dealing with back rent. And so they had mounting debt for all kinds of reasons. Um, and of course, everyone in America is dealing with supply chain issues, inflation. Um, one of the restaurant um, owners said to me that pre pandemic, they were paying $26 for a jug of cooking oil and now it's $59. But a biggest concern right now is the cost of energy. Pre-pandemic, he said he was paying like about $4,000, and now he's paying double that. Mm -hmm. So the profit margins for any Chinese or AAPI restaurant in Chinatown are so razor thin, and suddenly you have an extra $4,000 that you have to come up with to pay your Con Ed bill. That's uh, a pretty um, insurmountable uh, mountain to climb at this point. So my concern right now is the winter. There's always less people. It's always slower in Chinatown. But of greatest concern is the continued impact of anti-Asian hate crimes. So that means that at dinner time, people are not showing up the way they did pre-pandemic because of their issues of safety. So during the daytime, there are a lot of people that come out to shop and to eat. But at nighttime, I think people are feeling hesitant to come out. The walk in Chinatown can be really quiet at night. Um, Chinatown was always open late into like 1, 2 a.m. in the morning for some restaurants before 
now there are about four restaurants that I know of that are definitely open, five restaurants, until 10 p.m. But many restaurants are closing by 7.30 or 8 because there simply isn't the business. Mm -hmm. And they can't exist on just a lunch business income. Um, so that's why we need to bring in more people to, to make everyone feel safer. And I think that the restaurants that are open till 10 p.m. have mainly, not mainly, but there's a very large non-Asian customer base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very similar in, in Oakland Chinatown as well. And uh, San Francisco Chinatown certainly um, has a large tourist base um, in the center of its social fabric. So in China, in Oakland Chinatown, um, it's always been kind of been a working class Chinatown and less so touristy. Um, and so, you know, even before the pandemic, it would actually close early. It would be bustling early in the morning, close before business hours, you know, before the downtown business community hours um, ended. So um, in Oakland Chinatown, it's, it's a tale of resilient, resilience like all, all other Chinatowns. At one point, it was said that the dollar bounces 15 times in Chinatown before it exits the community. Um, and so for us, it, you know, it's trying to figure out there is such deep roots in Chinatown, and we know that it is uh, ground zero for development and gentrification. Yeah. Uh, we know we know it's the central trans central node in a transportation hub in in the Bay Area. So there's been a di diaspora of of the older Chinese families and uh, businesses out to the suburbs all throughout the Bay Area, but it continues to be that central node. And so the way we're approaching it is like how how this will this phenomenon is going to happen in this generation. In the future generations, they're going to stay in the suburb areas that are more built up. And so what do we do in this generation? And stories, Grace, again, going back to it is a very, very vital part of it, not just for the general public, but for ourselves, right? Like for our for our younger generations. Um, so I don't know. Do you have any any other thoughts on that, Grace? Um, so, you know, I realized during the, con during, during the pandemic that you can make some very interesting connections in life sometimes. And um, one of the people that was following my Instagram posts about supporting uh, chi Chinese restaurants, Love AAPI, came to New York and she's a food writer based in the East Bay. And um, she said to me, I, I really want to help. And um, actually, before she came, um, my post kind of raised her consciousness that these businesses were hurting. And so in Oakland, you have Peony Restaurant. Mm -hmm. She wrote a piece about Peony Dim Sum um, Restaurant uh, for the, is it called the Oakland Cider? Uh, do you oh, have a public? Cider. Yes. Yeah. And uh, she said that they were only doing takeout and they had already had to let like half their employees go. After that piece came out, they were able to hire back employees. Yeah. And then I think she wrote another piece. Um, and, you know, by 2021, they were back on their feet. Mm -hmm. And at this point, uh, or a few months ago, she wrote me that she was invited back to the restaurant and the manager said that he really attributes their bounce back to the article that she wrote. And so I think any way we can reach the media and get stories written about what's going on to raise public awareness, to get you know that human interest piece about what these guys are going through working seven days a week, you know, 14, 16 hour days. And, and a lot of uh, publications are interested in the immigrant story right now. So we have to like capitalize on it in any way that we can. Mm -hmm. And right now, um, next week, I'm partnering with the James Beard Foundation on a new social media campaign 
national social media campaign called Support Chinatowns, plural. And um, what we're trying to do is get people to do posts on their social channels, um, speaking about their local Chinatown, uh, give a shout out to a specific business, a menu item that you love, uh, something that you love to buy in Chinatown, you know, whether it's uh, the baby bok choy at 88 Natro or a particular tea at Grand Tea and Imports, um, and remind people to go to their local Chinatowns and dine in the restaurants, shop at the bakeries, markets, stores, because without our support, um, we are at risk of losing Chinatowns throughout the United States right now. Um, San Francisco's Chinatown, in August, I got the count from the Chinese Community Development Center that there were 50 shuttered stores on Grant Avenue. I'm born and raised in San Francisco. I don't think I've ever seen more than three shuttered stores, storefronts on Grant Avenue. That just broke my heart. Um, and, and these Chinatowns are more than great places to eat. They represent the American story. You know, that, um, yeah, we have to preserve and protect America's Chinatowns right now. So starting November 15th, I hope everyone who is listening in on this conference today will do a post on Instagram or Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and uh, give a shout out for your local Chinatown. And if you don't have a local Chinatown, give a shout out for your um, local AAPI market or restaurant, um, because I think the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to shower these communities with love and by showing up and showing our support. Thank you. Willow, do we still have time for one more question or should we open it up? <clears throat> Willow, you there? Yes, we have time for several questions. We have about 15 more minutes. Um, okay. And we do have several questions from the chat. So maybe I'll open up with just the first one that we had about um, if we have any data on the amount of businesses that shut down due to COVID, um, how many had to relocate, and where we can find these numbers. We did have some conversation in the chat and some responses from different participants, but I'm wondering, Grace, for you in particular, how, how would you get that data? Um, I don't know that data myself, um, but I, would, I can tell you that in April of 2020, uh, CNN reported that 59% of independently owned Chinese restaurants had ceased their credit card and debit card transactions implying that they had permanently closed. And at the same time, P.F. Chang's received some god awful amount of PPP loans and, um, and they reported that their sales had doubled. And I found that so terrifying because I thought to myself, and right now in New York City, I think it was in 2020, that P.F. Chang's opened their first restaurant in Manhattan in the financial district. And now I see two more are about to open in the city. And to me, if we don't support our mom and pop Chinese restaurants, um, we will be, <clears throat> we will be uh, left with the equivalent of, I call it, you know, the Olive Garden of Chinese restaurants, right? And to me, P.F. Chang's is not Chinese food. It, it doesn't have, it doesn't even come close. But um, yeah, so I, I don't know the statistics or where to find them. I am, after all, a Chinese cookbook author. <laughs> this is not my area of expertise at all. Uh, they, they call me the accidental voice for Chinatown. So <laughs> sorry about that. Well, I do know you can uh, talk to your the local Chinatown chambers. Um, uh, the at the city levels, you talk to economic development, uh, yeah. although sometimes they don't even know, right? Um, right? Sometimes it's hard to tell when something's shuttered or permanently closed. Um, in Oakland, 
There's less than 400 businesses prior to the pan pandemic. And I think latest counts been about 40 have been shuttered. Um, I do wanna say 18 of those was due to a fire uh, in the middle of the pandemic, plus the AAPI hate, hate crimes. So um, yeah, that's on our end. Willa, do you have another question? I do. Um, folks are asking about the social media strategy. Um, Grace, I love the story of you sitting on uh, doing the Instagram takeover in your pajamas. And so folks are just wondering um, if you can talk a little bit more about integrating your social media and marketing education with small businesses and how you've been successful in that space. Um, I think I've been most successful um, using hashtags, you know, so if it's a, a tea store that I'm uh, promoting or the, the G and J florist that suddenly started selling farmer's market produce, uh, you know, doing something like uh, NYC foodie, uh, farmer's market, uh, tomatoes, whatever they were selling in particular, uh, Chinatown, support Chinatowns, uh, shop local, that kind of thing really helped. But also um, hooking up with somebody that has a larger following than you and alerting them and getting them to share it. I think that's where uh, we can get some momentum actually happening. So, so reaching you are, out to you are reaching, social media savvy. What are you no, about? I'm the most non social media savvy person. But um, I, just I think started. my follow, I, I have a following of over 20,000 now. And I think during the pandemic, I got about easily like 15,000 new followers. Yeah. But I think it really is. Um, knowing which other followers are actually um, interested in similar interests than you, right? Mm -hmm. And then reaching out to them and saying, uh, could you please help me shed a little light to um, this, uh, highlight this, uh, spotlight this business. Um, I was very lucky, America's Test Kitchen uh, reached out to me and he the actually this, the editor, uh, editor in chief is Dan Souza. I need to actually credit him for giving me the idea to do the social media campaigns that I've done with the Beard Foundation. He is the one who said you should do a social media campaign uh, like Save China to Chinese Restaurants, and I was like, I, I don't really think I can make a difference. You know, I, I think at that point I had three or four thousand followers. And I was sort of hoping that I could hook up with him, that with America, America's Test Kitchen partnering with me, then I could reach a larger group of people. But he planted that seed in me and I kept on thinking about it. And I thought, I, I just need to partner with somebody who has a large following. And so I, I thought about approaching the James Beard Foundation. I only knew one person there. And I was very timid and shy about asking to partner. And so I finally contacted the one person that I know. And he said, oh, that's a really great idea. Let me present it to, you know, the team and get back to you. And he got back to me like the next day and said, they're very interested in doing this with you. So I was completely shocked. And the next week he left the Beard Foundation. Wow. So if I had not contacted him, I would have no contacts at the Beard Foundation. But as I was, as the pandemic unfolded, a lot of the things that I did, I was very shy and hesitant. And then I got over it and just thought, it's for Chinatown. Just hmm. do it. Just hit that send button. There's no harm in asking. People can only say no. And that's how I was when I reached out to the media sometimes, it would be like, oh, I really don't want to send this email. And then I think, but Chinatown needs it, Grace. Like, get over it. So I think it's easier than if it was me promoting my book. Then it's really icky, right? It just feels so self-serving. But here I could just say, you know, think about Mr. Lee is struggling with his business in Chinatown. Like, they, 
there were there were days that I would walk into some of the restaurants in 2020 and the owners would say to me, we haven't had one order today. So that's what motivated me to hit the send button, right? Yes. Uh, and and there's this wonderful video that we did in Coronavirus Chinatown Stories for this business called KK Discount. He lost, I think it was like 50% or 70%, 50% of his regular walk-in business. And he also supplied uh, restaurants with, you know, plates and dishes and things like that. His restaurant business dropped 90%. We go to do this interview with him in June of 2020. And he says in this video something about, I had two new customers today. So I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that if I do a really good job, they'll come back and they'll tell their friends to come to my store. And I remember Dan, the videographer, Dan on and the, the videographer and I, as we left that interview, I just said, oh my God, he's happy because he got two new customers. So <clears throat> it just made me realize that nothing is too small. And there's this wonderful quote that Desmond Tutu uh, said that I discovered during the pandemic, which is do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good <clears throat> put together that overwhelm the world. So um, I can't emphasize enough that you just telling your friends to show up to Chinatown or telling people that the moon cakes or sponge cakes or almond cookies at this bakery are so fantastic. These guys are operating on such tiny margins, just three new people showing up and buying it makes a difference. And it does, there is a little bit of a snowball effect. Yeah. And so you've been your own one woman army. Uh, uh, yeah. what you're doing. But you also partnered with Welcome to Chinatown. And so I was wondering if you could just speak really quickly. Welcome to, there's Welcome to Chinatown. There's Think Chinatown. There's, you know, different kind of efforts happening. So from, especially with us being so interested in, putting creative accelerators into cultural districts. Can you speak a little bit about the younger generation and what they are doing to help? Yeah, so Welcome to Chinatown is this extraordinary nonprofit that started in Manhattan at the start of 2020. The two women are Victoria Lee and um, Jennifer Tan. They're just in their early 30s and they're just uh, dynamos. They didn't quit their day jobs and they assembled uh, these young volunteers that are savvy with marketing and uh, social media, everything. And they helped a lot of Chinatown businesses create websites, um, freshen up the look of their uh, businesses, and they raised a tremendous amount of money. You saw in the PBS piece over $600,000 that they put back into Chinatown. Um, but somebody on Facebook noticed the work that I was doing and he uh, sent me a direct message and said, I think you should start a fundraiser under your name. And I was like, I don't think I could raise any ascent. And he's like, I, I think you could. And in 2020, there was less GoFundMe fatigue, but I think we started this 2021 and I um, contacted Welcome to Chinatown because I didn't want to deal with money. And so they put the fundraiser, the GoFundMe on their site, and we raised over $40,000. And we put that money into legacy restaurants that I was worried that we could lose in Chinatown. And those, resident, those uh, restaurants fed those who are in need within the community. So, you know, you just have to, there's all kinds of little possibilities lurking everywhere and i think you just have to be alert and speaking to people about ways that we can lift each other up mm -hmm. but if this guy jonathan forgash had not reached out to me we wouldn't have had that forty thousand dollars same thing another friend asked me she said i did this little fundraiser and i raised like a few hundred dollars uh for personal security alarms. And I don't speak Cantonese, 
So I was wondering if you would go with me into Chinatown. I want to distribute these personal security alarms. We did that in the start of 2021. And I could not believe the looks on the waiters, waitresses' faces, um, shop clerks, like, you're giving this to us? You know, they talked about how scared they are leaving Chinatown late at night, that they have to walk to the subway, ride the subway, walk home. And it's just this alarm that lets off this screeching sound that costs like $3 a piece. We buy them on Amazon. And, uh, you know, we ran out, she had maybe 200 alarms or something. And we ran out of them after a few hours. And, and that planted a seed in me, like, I want to get more of these alarms out to people in Chinatown. Every time I saw an elderly person in Chinatown, I think, are you going to make it home today? Like, it's so courageous of you to be out here. So someone suggested that I reach out to this organization called AAFE, uh, Asian Americans for Equality. And uh, we did a partnership to raise money, and they knew to reach out to Bank of America to match the first $10,000. So we raised over $24,000 and got 7,000 alarms out into the community. But, you know, they're just random connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here, in, here in Oakland, uh, our welcome to Chinatown is Cut Fruit Collective. And... Uh, you know, there's the same thing, younger generation, social media savvy, wanting to do something for Chinatown. Um, in the retail sphere, outside of the pandemic, retail was dying anyway, right? Um, what do you do with empty spaces? What do you do and, and why would people come to places like Chinatown when retail is no longer, you know, viable? Um, so we've had to think about all these things. And by partnering with these younger groups, actually, um, and interestingly enough, Cut Fruit Collective was used to be called Save Our Chinatowns. It was started by a New York artist, Jocelyn Tsai, who was living in Oakland. And she has her own tremendous following. So she actually single-handedly outraised the, the chamber, outraised a bunch of big organizations with GoFundMe at the time and really started Save Our Chinatowns and then pivoted it. Uh, now it's there's these two other uh, folks that are just doing a tremendous job with it. But, you know, and together what we're thinking is like, okay, how do we do things that that are tipping point projects in Chinatown, both economically, culturally, and marketing wise. So um, it's been very exciting to work with younger folks that are invested in Chinatown um, because it's that kind of like, you know, Grace is saying it's all about sometimes improbable connections that, that pave the way for the future. So very excited about that part of it. Well, thank you all so much. This has been such an exciting conversation to be able to have between the two of you. I wanna end with just one thing um, from you, Grace, which is folks are asking, how can they um, follow that social media campaign that you created? What's the hashtag? What's the date? How do they look it up? Thank you. Um, so it's hashtag support Chinatowns, plural, Chinatowns with an S. And we are going to launch on November the 15th. And Amy Tan said she would do a post. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're hoping to get some really big names to um, voice their love of Chinatown. Um, but everyone should do a post on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and just share your story Tell us about your Chinatown, why you love it, and give a shout out for a specific business because apparently that's the best way to drive business into Chinatown is that somebody knows like, oh my God, those dump these, this place has the best soup dumplings or um, the best uh, baked cha siu bao, you know, like some little, my parents have been eating this ever since I was a child. This is our go-to place. People want that insider info. All right, that is so true. Um, and I just wanna thank again, both Tommy and Grace for this fabulous conversation. It was special to me, not only because I got to see my old mentor at Stanford University, Gordon Chang on the screen, but also because I've seen that restaurant um, in the video in Chinatown. And I was just there two weeks ago in Manhattan's Chinatown. And 
experienced what you're talking about, Grace, in terms of the vibrancy and those relationships. And I, I love that description of the China of, of Dim Sum as Chinese church, um, all those things, but also that extreme vulnerability that so many of these BIPOC and immigrant owned businesses are facing from the tiny margins and the suburbanization, xenophobia and anti-Asian violence and the rising cost of it um, due to inflation. So this is such an important conversation and thank you so much for being here. I wanna invite our audience to stay with us. We have another sound bath meditation coming up and then another important conversation starting at 3.15, um, open for business and how do we keep businesses open. Thank you.